it's with great pleasure that I get to host a panel today. Um, so we'll go from my uh, left as we go across. Uh, with me we have Mary Lamonis. Welcome, Mary. Uh, Mary uh, is with the REA Group, uh, Group General Manager there. So thank you for joining us. Mary has a wealth of experience with HS over many years and has previously spoken at our conference. Uh, we have Vanessa. Welcome from Richard Crooks. Uh, Vanessa will uh, take us on the journey. And when we started looking about who we're going to bring on our panel, we thought with the, the speculation going in around construction and what's happening, what better to bring construction to our conference? So welcome, Vanessa. And on the end, who needs no introduction at all, uh, Sean, welcome. I'll say welcome home, but home's really New Zealand. Uh, welcome back to Australia after three and a half years. Uh, Sean, our chair uh, for Human Synergistics Australia and New Zealand, also on the board of Human Synergistics International. And uh, a wealth of stories and experience. Um, the team out the back said, DB, keep it to 30 minutes. All right, so, so we'll get straight into the panel and we'll keep moving. Um, Vanessa, we'll start in the middle, we'll start with you, eh? Okay. Um, why is culture important for you and Richard Crooks? Oh, great question and certainly one relevant for today. I would say culture is a differentiator and it's not easy to copy. And it also needs to be carefully crafted, so which is why this work is so, so critically important. You referenced it before. The construction industry has been in a really interesting time and space continuum. And I loved that um, quote that Todd put up before around you always have a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> it really resonated because in the construction industry, there's certainly been quite a few punches in the face over the last couple of years. And it would have been really easy to say we need to pause this and focus on what's going on in the industry, but we didn't because we knew at Richard Crooks how important culture was and rather than pausing, stopping or going slow, we doubled down knowing that it was our differentiator and that any investment or any organisation that invested on the downturn would win on the upturn. So super critical in terms of weathering the storm that is the construction industry and we think it's going to be the thing that differentiates us ongoing as, as we come out of the, the interesting time that the construction industry is in at the moment. In terms of me personally, I just love the complexity of culture and what that brings. Um, when I was early in my career, I foolishly did one culture change program and decided I knew it all, and that I could go to another organisation and simply do a plug and play, and everyone would um, live happily ever after, but learnt very quickly that that's not the case, that culture is very contextual, that culture needs to be evolved and changed depending on the context. Different industries, different organisations all have different needs, which links back to that complexity that really attracts me to the work that is culture. Thanks, Vanessa. Mary, you've got a wealth of experience beyond REA, which is heavily technology company now. Yes. Why culture for you and why culture for REA? Look, I think it was really interesting joining REA, coming from Campbell Arnott's, where the combined age of those companies was over 300 years old, and then stepping into a company that was 25 years old. Um, and on this huge growth curve, probably dealing with a young adult, I would say. Um, but I think culture just becomes that ultimate leveller. And when we started to do the work at REA, and Corinne was really helpful helping us articulate that notion of the twin engine plane. You know, strategy guiding us and culture driving us. And as Vanessa said, it is complex. It is all the things. It's not just one piece. And so the ability to be able to anchor that with strategy guiding us, culture driving us to deliver high performance and then being able to create a baseline around that for a business that had never really done culture work before, um, not, not in that sort of level of, I, I would say, deep measurement way, um, was really helpful to be able to create a calling cry for the business and give us a sense of where we already knew we were strong but what the opportunity was of where we could go. And so we did our first OCI in 2021, our next one's in 2024, um, and we've got a very clear view of what we're trying to drive for around that, so that's really exciting for us. Thank you. Sean, 
<coughs> I'm going to keep you to three minutes. Um, why culture? I thought I'd give two reasons, uh, sort of like each end of a scale, so from a social psychology perspective and from an economic financial perspective. So from a social psychology perspective, I think everybody in the room would agree with the, the, the precept that every action is preceded by a thought. So before we do anything, whether that's interacting with an individual group or planning something, writing a project report, we're thinking about that. So the question to ask yourself is that given your organisation's culture, what sort of thoughts are likely to be running around inside people's heads before they act? Is it more passive defensive stuff like, will this please my boss, will this keep me out of trouble, will it sail through smoothly, whether it's aggressive defensive, will this get me brownie points, will I be looking like a hero if I do this, etc. Or in fact, is it constructive, is it the right thing to do, does it reflect integrity, does it reflect a willingness to solve a customer's problem, etc. So firstly, from a social psychology, which every organisation is a social psychological unit, if you like, it's influencing how people think, and how people think influence how they act, and how they act, of course, influences how they perform. So at the other end of the scale, given the fantastic sort of data you got from the two guys from Sanitarium, is that we know that culture impacts on where we can do decent research studies where we're matching like for like, not just looking across industries and hoping that they are similar, we, we can research like to like. We know that culture influences customer service, quality of product, revenue, profitability, uh, safety, all of these outcomes which, which earn or save money for the organisation. So as you see with sanitarium, culture is important because it actually helps you grow rather than go backwards. And sitting underneath that is what I always call the hidden cost of culture or the hidden cost of a poor culture. So for instance, uh, staff turnover levels. So, uh, I'm just trying to remember the number. Ari, the Australian Human Resources Institute folks tell us that every time somebody leaves and you have to replace them, it costs you 1.5 times their salary. And this is average, remember, so there's going to be 50% that are costing more and 50% that's costing less. The current attrition rate in Australia is 9.5% uh, per annum. So if we put those two numbers together, 9.5% multiplied by 1.5, let's make the 9.5 10 so I don't have to think too hard. 10% multiplied by 1.5 is 15. So 15% 15 of your wage is lost as a consequence of a poor culture. And of course, remember, that's the halfway point. There's a lot worse than that. Wastage, time, effort, presenteeism, absenteeism, etc are all elements that are hidden but the cost of having a poor culture because we've seen when organisations have been able to improve that culture that their staff turnover level has reduced, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, apart from it is my business, from an economic point of view, you're a mug if you don't. It's as simple as that. Uh, well said, Sean. Uh, Mary. We've seen earlier today uh, leadership and culture work hand in hand. Uh, and I know you've had your own journey, but provide some insight on the importance of leadership and the work you've done on leadership broadly or for yourself and the role that plays with culture. I think it's everything. Um, you know, within REA, when you look at our PNC strategy, we have leadership in the centre. Um, surrounded by talent, experiences and sustainability, surrounded by a high performance culture. And so for us, and for me personally, I, I think it is everything. Um, I, I, at, at the end of the day, whether you're a senior leader or a, you know, a line leader of, 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 a, of a frontline team, and I think hybrid has just amplified that, you know, or, or COVID amplified that, because so much of what we create in terms of the experience is felt through the leader doesn't matter what PNC teams create, how whiz-bang it is, how amazing it is, the deployment of that comes through the leader. And if that leader is doing a great job, that is felt, and if that leader is doing a poor job, that is felt. And I, so I think that combination of being able to, you know, and that's why I love LSI and OCI so much, because you can actually say to a leader, look at your LSI, and now look at how your team, if you know, you've got the sample size, sees the culture. 
and being able to have that conversation with leaders is just has been really powerful for us. Um, so for me, I think it is everything. I, I got asked in a board strategy day, probably about three years ago now, by one of our directors, you've got a lot of things on the list. If there was just one thing, what would it be? And I said, leaders. Um, because I think, and, and that was pre-COVID, that was actually, um, I think it was the March 2020 board meeting just before we went into lockdown. Um, and, and I think uh, I would double down on that even more in the, in the co context that has occurred since COVID. Beautiful, thanks Mary. Vanessa, I know the team at Richard Crooks and I've seen your team coming through our office for sessions. Leadership and the role it plays from your perspective. Oh, it's, it's so critical. So our uh, mantra is around creating great experiences for our people and making it an enjoyable experience. And then that in turn will create a great experience for our clients. And leaders are at the, the centre of that and leaders create those experiences. And what we're seeing is a change in those experiences from inconsistent experiences, depending on the leader that you have, to a more consistent experience. And in construction, it's quite different to other industries whereby you join an organisation and you'll work for a leader for the duration of a project. And then when that building is built, you move to the next leader and the next project. So there's always a leadership transition that happens and so therefore the propensity for an inconsistent experience is vast. So working with leaders to create a consistent experience is really, really important. And I would also say that the organisation has grown considerably and very quickly. And in the early days, our executive team had deep personal relationships with everybody in the business, and that's what makes the business very special, is the deep personal relationships. But as the business has grown, it becomes untenable for a small cluster of leaders to hold the relationship with, with hundreds and hundreds of people. And it became clear that we needed to share that relationship and that inspiration with the broader leadership team and the, the project managers and the project directors that lead these people day to day, yet we hadn't really given them a lot of support, data, education, feedback on how to be a great leader and how to create great experiences. The LSI was a great step in creating some definition around what leadership looks like and then the program that we're undertaking is a deep dive into analysing that, thinking about better ways of doing it, all in service of creating great experiences. I love that word of consistency and leadership. Thank you. Sean, the role of leadership in culture and ultimately performance. Uh, how long we got? <laughs> 17 minutes and 13 seconds. <laughs> this is our 25th conference, so we've talked a lot about the subject over the years. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's a, just an absolute truism that leadership is critical to cultural uh, adaptation, development and change. That it never happens without support from senior executives. You've seen a fantastic example of that this morning with the sanitarium, with Todd and Peter. The CEO is giving permission and the head of HR is making things happen and they're doing it through their leadership team. The way we lead influences everything about how the organisation functions. And so I just want to also add in that one of the most misunderstood metaphors in the history of management is the notion of the so-called burning platform, which I'm sure you've heard of. And by definition, a burning platform reason for organisational development and culture change is a defensive strategy. So we tend to look at a more constructive approach to that, and we call that burning passion. So somebody in the organisation needs to have the passion to make the change happen, to see the benefits, to not be a mug, to reiterate my earlier comment. It ideally is a CEO, but it doesn't have to be. We have a very good example. I won't steal his stories, because he is now a consultant. Bob Barber's sitting up the back there, near where I was sitting for the early morning session. And he had the burning passion as the head of human resources at Lion. Not the CEO, the head of HR, but he had that passion that drove him to eventually get the CEO on board, and the CEO's response ultimately was, why didn't I do this years ago? So it's everything, simple as that. Thank you, Sean. There's a word that gets thrown around a lot, which is accountability. Um, my preference is probably more ownership. Um, how important is accountability ownership, Vanessa? 
Oh, it is an interesting word. It is a word that gets um, spoken about a lot um, and a lot at Richard Crooks. So three of our five values um, reference accountability, client first, we do what we say and delivering certainty, all of which accountability underpins that. But what I would say is how we've driven accountability in the past is not necessarily the way we need to drive accountability going forward. And what I mean by that is a largely perfectionistic organisation, and I'm sure if we're building something for you, you would like us to be perfectionistic and get it right, um, and that's traditionally how we've, we've operated, and perfectionism is um, enacted oftentimes with uh, power and demanding, shouting, threatening, and what we're seeing in the industry in the current context is a supply and demand issue with subcontractors. So a subcontractor receiving multiple calls from clients every day, choosing where they're going to attend work, a shouting, demanding client is always bottom of the list. So we know and we've seen reference that getting accountability delivered in an achievement orientated way is far more effective. And our leaders, after they've tried this for 12 months, are saying it's a better way to co-create a vision, to talk about how we can win-win together, as opposed to simply demanding and threatening people to turn up on site and get it done perfectly every time. The other thing I would say around accountability, it's an interesting one in the context of cultural change, because culture takes time to change as does leadership behaviours, and what we are seeing is a need for balancing accountability and patience, giving leaders the time and space to develop and undo very bad habits that have been ingrained in their uh, psyche for many, many, many years and giving them the opportunity and the chance to change. On the other, on the, the, that hand, on the other hand, being quite explicit and going to the organisation to say, this is what culture at Richard Crooks looks like now and this is our standards of behaviours, and therefore an expectation that those behaviours are immediately evidenced every single day by every single person versus this patience to know that we're not perfect, we do get it wrong, we are humans, and patience to let people develop so that they're getting it right more than they're getting it wrong rather than just a straight down the line view on accountability. Awesome. Excellent. Mary, how important is accountability? I think um, ditto everything that Vanessa said in terms of the individual side. I might take the enterprise view for us. Um, we were really clear when we did our first OCI about what success in three years' time would look like, and I think that's the patience part. So when we did our first full OCI for REA, and, and I wasn't surprised at these results, but they were pretty... Um, uh, you know, quite compelling. Um, we were above the 60th percentile in all the constructive styles. Um, we had a little bow tie. Everything else was pretty much underneath the 50th in the aggressive, um, in the passive, in the, the passive defensive, in the aggressive defensive. But what was really interesting is our humanistic was 87th percentile and our achievement was 64th. And that's what we honed in on as our opportunity. Because the culture, you just feel it. The minute anyone comes into REA, the thing that everyone will say to you, and this certainly predates me, I don't take credit for this, um, everyone is so willing to help, guide, coach, collaborate. Um, and, and so the conversation we started having as an exec is, look at where this business is at, look at how successful it is, and yet there's a 23 percentage point delta between achievement and humanistic. What would it look like if we were above the 80th in both? And that really became the, the, the calling card, if you like, um, and the accountability thread that we've really tried to weave through, because you can't do an OCI every month, is um, you know, a, a bit of a culture pulse where we actually ask all our employees, you, know, you get a survey twice a year, depending on your birthday, 12 questions, um, and some of them are obviously guided to those themes around achievement and humanistic to really get a sense of how we're travelling. Because none of us want to sit there in three years' time, February 2024, wondering, did we get there, or how close are we? And so that's been really effective for us to help us fine-tune shape. And then obviously all the levers that you have to pull, whether it be you know, integrated people practices, ways of working, um, our, all, the way we're organised, our leadership programs, all of that has now been reshaped as a result of that 
what we're calling our high performance X. So to me, accountability is everything and it has to be chunked down because to Vanessa's point, patience is required, but people also need to see progress. And I think you need to be able to show that. And, and so the shifts that we've made, again, based on the culture pulse, we've made some shifts. Is it enough to get us to 80, 80? It's not like we'll sit there in February and if we don't get to 80, we'll go, oh, it's all over. But it certainly has been a really helpful guide for us. 80, 80. 80, like 80. 80, 80. I like, I like it. Sean. Yeah, before I speak, I need to confess, with this echoing chamber that we're sitting in where it's all being projected that way, I found it very difficult to hear what the two of you were saying personally. So if I'm about to step on your toes, please forgive me. I think accountability is a really crap word. <laughs> and when anybody ever has talked to me about accountability around culture change, I've always had, it's been spoken to me in a tone of voice that makes me think of medieval torture chambers. <laughs> and you're holding my feet over hot burning coal saying you will be accountable because that's how it's used. It's used as a sledgehammer to crack a peanut. So obviously the idea of commitment, participation, involvement, belief, etc., is an important part of it. But once I start hearing organisations talking about making, which is a power-oriented word by definition, making people accountable for culture change, I really do get that picture in my mind time and time again. So my, my advice around accountability is to try and build commitment. Understand that resistance to change is a first step in adapting to change. So treat resistance as a form of adaptation. Get your numbers together. If you're doing a culture survey with us and you've got units that you can match and block and like, this is the, the researcher in me talking now, if you'll forgive me. Uh, where you can compare units to units, whether it's external stuff like revenue and sales, or whether it's internal stuff like safety, or uh, quality of product, or staff turnover, etc. If you can put the evidence together, which is what SHAPE did in the early days, and I know Lion have done it extensively over the years, as have a number of others. If you can put the evidence in front of people in the organisation that this stuff is not some airy, fairy, sort of unable to be identified concept, but something that influences your day-to-day -day activity and influences your day-to-day -day performance. And people can see the link between culture and performance, or if you're not doing the culture stuff, if you're using the LSI for your leadership stuff, the relationship between leadership and performance, then it becomes a compelling story to tell. And again, go back to my earlier comment, is you can be the one with the burning passion to get that commitment and involvement. Be careful of the word accountability. It has power-style overtones to it. Mm and ultimately leads to avoidance and power styles within organisations. So I hope I haven't said something... Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Just for some reason or other, something must have changed slightly. I couldn't get past the echo. So there, is a little, there is a little echo up here for us. Mary, you're on the journey. Yes, we are. And one of the questions we always hear is, show us the proof. Prove to us that this is going to make a difference to our organisation. What are you seeing as an impact so far on your journey? The data is helpful, um, but again, I think, as we've all probably experienced in this room, people will find the story that they want to tell for themselves. Um, you know, if people want to make excuses around the data, either positively or negatively, they will. I think ultimately, a lot of it is around how people see others showing up and trying to see that at scale. You know, and if I look at the journey that we've been on as REA, and I, I hear Sean's point about the, the overtone or the undertones of accountability, um, what I've found is that there's been, you know, we, we talk a lot at REA about courage over comfort, and that's been something that you can see the organisation shifted to. You can feel it in the conversations that we're having. Um, you can see that people are, getting more comfortable in the discomfort of being honest and not worrying that that's going to blow up the relationship. Um, and and, and uh, to me, that's the real proof in the pudding. Uh, I think the data's fantastic, and I think we, we would all know um, as a function it's something that potentially we haven't done the best job at in the past. I think we're getting much better, um, I think, within the people and culture space around having a lot more data. Um, but I think, you know, the proof is in those conversations and, and you can see the willingness of the organisation to, to be more honest. 
um, and, and, and to call it out when we're not living in service of what we've asked people to do. So from my perspective, I, I think it's, it's in those moments where you really see that come to life. I definitely love courage over comfort. I hope people got that one as a, as a quote. Vanessa, what's some of the impact you're seeing? We're in very early days of our culture journey. All up, we've been at it for um, 21 months, but a significant proportion of that has been with our MD and our senior leadership folk. And about 11 months with the, the top 100, which is where we're focusing as we speak. So we've only done one round of um, data collection. But what we have been doing, much like you, Mary, is pulse surveying. We've seen that more than half the organisation have seen an increase in their experiences that they've been having with their leader as a result of them spending quite a short amount of time in, in the program. We've seen a significant increase in the number of people feeling like they've been genuinely listened to, and also a significant increase in the number of people who feel like they've been involved in the decisions that are being made that involve them and, and their work. So that's very, very pleasing. So that's the data side of things. On the um, more qualitative side of things, we have just come off the back of some group coaching sessions, which I attended the majority of, and just heard personally the stories of 100 leaders of what their journey's been like, what changes they've made, and to say that it's been heartwarming and my cup is full is a complete understatement because they have been quite inspirational stories to hear going from my, I feel so much more comfortable in, in my role. Um, I feel so much happier and satisfied in, in what I'm doing. I'm getting better outcomes with people, but also the stuff that I love around my relationship with my kids is just transformed because I'm bringing this stuff home. My relationship with my partner is different because I'm being different in the way I operate because I can see the benefits of it. So we do have some early data sets to prove that it's working, but the stories just speak for themselves. Stories do speak. Yeah. Sean, no doubt you've got several impact stories, probably in the several hundred. What's your favourite impact story of culture? It's my favourite story. I have I got time to tell a couple. You've got time for a couple. Um, I'm going to tell you one that's a little bit weird, perhaps, but it's probably one of the most exciting times of my career. I had my 50th anniversary as a consultant in February next year, so my stories are a long time ago. I've been pretending to be a manager and a leader since then. Um, but I did, a, I did a major job for a retail commercial bank, much like the big ones here, but not in Australia. And uh, just within the context of this, there was leadership development, the LSI, et cetera, et cetera. And I was sitting in my office one day, and one of the office staff came in and said, there's a young guy at the front door that would like to meet you. And I said, who and what? And she said, I, I don't know. He just said, I want to meet Sean McCarthy. And I said, what the hell? So bring him in. And this guy stood there in front of me, he was about 18 years of age, and he said to me, I just wanted to thank you. He said, when I turned 14, I stopped talking to my father. My father went through one of your leadership development workshops and came home and started to talk to me. I just wanted to meet the man who had done that to the old bastard. <laughs> So we change people's lives. I've always said to people when I used to run accreditation workshops for LSI, treadeth carefully because they treadeth on my soul. That we really do open people up. We open them to new opportunities, new experience. The other answer is the businessman in me. In my consulting career, I've worked with a bank who went from number four to number one in every single measure you can possibly think of in their marketplace. I helped reorient a lotteries, national lotteries organisation and that became so effective and so globally first class that they were the first lotteries organisation in the world to allow their staff to be able to buy tickets 
typically with these sorts of organisations, because there's a potential for theft and backwards engineering, staff are not allowed to buy tickets. But as the Chief Executive said at a conference in Chicago once, when asked the question, how can you do that, his answer was wonderfully constructive. He said, you've got two choices. Either you develop technology that can't be hacked and people can therefore buy a ticket if they work for the company, or you rely on systems that aren't reliable. It's, it's that simple. I've worked with a retail chain at 245 stores over a five-year period. Profit increased by $175 million simply by focusing on how people lead at the store level. I've worked with government organisations from ministers down to delivery outputs. One in particular I worked with for a period of about five years, and without going into any details because it's quite complex, their outputs multiplied by a factor of seven over a 12-month period. So they became significantly more effective in the type of service that they delivered on behalf of the government. So that's why I use expressions like, you're a bit of a mug, if you don't see this, because, I mean, sanitarium is the living example in front of you today. Look at that, that revenue rise that Todd talked about. You don't, I mean, this shit does not happen by magic. It happens because somebody is doing something positive about it in an organised manner. I'll stop at that point. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll close, and I'll use some of my buffer time. One final question. Uh, and the sanitarium, Todd and Peter spoke about starting again. So, Vanessa, if you were to start again tomorrow, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Um, I, on reflection, would run a parallel process around process. So, leadership is, and the role that leaders play is still the primary uh, activity. We, I, we, if we had time again, I would run more hard, harder on, on process so that the infrastructure that sits around leadership was more well supported. And what I mean by that is recruitment practices, talent assessment, promotion, all of that stuff is for us to now do and do quickly. But I feel like those things augment leadership decisions and we've, we're, we're playing a bit of catch up on that. Excellent. Yeah. Mary, what would you do differently? I got a great idea this morning in the green room from Peter and Belinda from Rubberbeck, so I hope I'm not stealing their thunder. Um, I, I think we've done a really great job of engaging certain leaders on the journey. Um, they were talking about something they've done there called culture coaches, um, and that's a real engagement across, outside of PNC, across the entire organisation, you know, what we'd call from a change point of view, the fire starters, if you like. Um, we, I would have done that more deliberately. I think that was a great idea, and it's not too late. You know, I, I said to Belinda, can we have a chat after this and figure out what you've done? Um, I think, you know, how do you do the end of the engagement between the functional drive of PNC as well as the, the, the broader business? And certainly, certain leaders um, through our talent programs are part of that journey, but I think we have a bigger opportunity. Those fire starters. Sean. One thing that I learned. Yeah, what would you do differently? Rewind the clock. Yeah. Time again. I think the, the most important thing I've learned and therefore would do differently is that everybody changes at their own pace. And so therefore organisations have to learn their own change needs. You can't force it, you can't push it, you can't make it happen, you've got to let it happen. And so I've developed the philosophy over probably the last 20 years, which would be a very small part of my career, uh, that every organisation needs to learn its own lessons in its own time. All you can do is help them through that process. Very wise, at their own pace. Can you please thank our panellists, Mary, Vanessa and Sean. Thank you.